So, I mean, I guess, what have you been reading? What have I been reading? Well, um, I told you that uh, I, I wanted to, I wanted to read at least, at least a couple of Portuguese novels before, mm -hmm. um, before you and I talked. I, I just sort of wanted to get first into what a Portuguese novel sounds like. And, and, uh, um, and I started with a classic. I started with Fernando Paseo. Am I pronouncing Pessoa. his name right? Pessoa. 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 Yeah. Because I'm used to, uh, yeah, Spanish here. And they, yeah, they actu like actually, actually, the pronunciation in Portuguese is Fernando Pessoa. But anyway. Fernando Pessoa. Okay, yeah. that's beautiful. Um, so he wrote um, the Book of Disquiet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in the 1920s, and you know, very prolific guy, a poet. Um, yeah, but one thing that's very interesting there is that, like, 99% of what he wrote, he, he didn't publish while he was alive, and he asked friends to burn it all down when uh, he was dead, but they didn't do it. So basically, he only published one small book called The Message, and then the rest was basically in his bedroom. You know, I guess, like the like a true nihilist, you know? <laughs> Burn right. it all down. And it, what was so interesting to me about, about the Book of Disquiet was just how... Um, just how much that that kind of, that frame of mind that the book is in this sort of nihilistic frame of mind this sort of mm -hmm. existential crisis frame of mind yeah is has completely permeated the modern conversation and so reading it was like reading almost any old article in the atlantic at this point or or any or you know in 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 almost any publication because uh we're still we're grappling with these existential issues that that he was writing about in the 1920s and that only a small cohort of intellectuals, mostly in Europe, were, yeah. um, were struggling with. And what I, but what I thought was, was interesting about the book, and it was, it was hard to listen to something that nihilistic because I, I did it, mm -hmm. I in part read and the other part I did on Audible. And um, it, was, it was hard to kind of, It, it was it was painful to read because I feel like we've been swallowed by it, mm -hmm. by by a certain nihilism. Yeah. Um, but it was also very interesting to read. And what I thought was really interesting about it, uh, and that I see lacking somewhat in um, the modern conversation, at, at least from what I can see. And and maybe you can find plenty of uh, of examples where I'm wrong. Is that he seemed to be self-aware about his own nihilism. He really didn't fully believe it. Hmm. Um, I mean, I, I want to. I wrote some notes. I want to read you what he yeah, said. Sure. I think was really interesting. He's like, my generation lost faith in God for the same reason our parents had it. We have uselessly surrendered ourselves to aesthetics and sensations taking nothing seriously and recognizing our sensations as all we have. You know, and at, yeah. at, at another point he says that he's, you know, he sees life as a roadside hotel that he stays in until the coach comes and takes and takes him to where he has no idea because I know nothing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, um, yeah. and that's, that's kind of what I thought was interesting because he, I, I think maybe, to say that he had a sort of self-loathing about himself in this regard is is extreme. I don't think that's necessarily true, but he definitely had an awareness about it and and seemed to long for, you know, perhaps his parents' generation's faith or something like it. Yeah. And yet it was constantly, you know, and, and he felt it was almost within his grasp, but he just couldn't. Yeah, you know, the book I, I told you about, The Message, I think that's the title in English, because in Portuguese is a mensagem, so, yeah, the, so yeah. the literal translation is that. So, uh, The Message is extremely different from most of what he wrote, because it was basically him uh, writing about 
a potential new future Portuguese empire. So it was sort of him trying to elevate Portugal yeah. to new heights mm -hmm. or something like that. So he was very much in that book into things like uh, nationalism. And I, I'm, and I mean, all of those things that tend, what he called later on social fictions, tend to mm -hmm. give meaning to people's lives. So, and he wrote an entire book trying to really elevate the spirit of the people. But then... Oh, well, that's, there you go. That's... Yeah. Okay. So, I, I mean, I guess that sometimes, I, I would imagine that some, uh, sometimes people also do that because they are themselves trying to cope with their own nihilism and, yes. and also their mental instability, let's say. <laughs> That's that struck me in the book of disquiet as well. Exactly what you said, trying to cope with his own nihilism and um, his desire to be out of it, you know, to crawl out of it, to cope with it, to, um, you know, as, as we said, to maybe have some faith in something other than his nihilism. You know, you know, uh, when I think about Pessoa, I compare it, I compare him uh, very strongly to Nietzsche mm -hmm. in a way. Because, uh, I mean, uh, the book of this, uh, this Quiet is one of the few writings he has. I mean, it wasn't a book exactly, it was sort of organized posthumously by friends and editors right. and others. I mean, but, but it, it, it is one of the few compilations where he writes in prose. He was mostly yes. a poet. But yes. when he writes in prose, he tends to be very aphoristic. And that's like Nietzsche. You know, yes, I think you know no, what I, I mean. Right. And then I mean, it's sort of those. You have those sort of. Uh, I mean, ideas strike you, right? And you write them down, and it's like sometimes a sentence or two sentences or just a paragraph, and just that for you makes so much sense that you don't seem to need to explain anything else about what you're writing there. You know, it's just like. Boom, uh -huh. that, that's it. Okay. It's like the same style as Nietzsche. Yeah, and the, very and, complete. Yeah, and then, I mean, I even remember Nietzsche saying that uh, his goal was to write in a few sentences what, other, what would take others an entire book. So, something like that. Well, he, he was often successful. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that that is really hard. I mean, it, people underestimate how. Oh yeah. How it's, it's much it harder because there are writers that are extremely verbose. Yes. But yes. But, but writing, uh, 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 like, you have to be very very careful to really, uh, to really make it right in just a few sentences. You know what I mean? Yes, you have to think it through completely yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and look at it from every possible angle. Yeah, it has to be crystal clear in your head. Yes. It's like this is so clear to me that I can explain it in one sentence. Right. So, something like that. And I mean, and then it's the issue that, okay, and then if people get it, they get it. If they don't, they don't. Whatever. <laughs> Yeah. And then, I mean, I also compare the two of them, not only because of that, but also because Nietzsche read a lot of science from the 19th century. And then Fernando Pessoa, he was a fiction writer, but, and he studied literature in college, but in his personal library, he also had a lot of science. And why am I mentioning that? Because I think that uh, if you have certain personality traits, like high neuroticism, for example, if you expose yourself to science, it, you very easily go down the rabbit hole of nihilism. Because, I mean, a, a science is, is very nice, 
but you, but if you want to really be able to cope with the implications of it without uh, falling down the rabbit hole of life being absolutely meaningless and nothing making any sense at all, then you have to have a proper set of personality traits, like for example, low neuroticism. Uh, yeah, I guess that's that's the main one. Other, other, otherwise, I mean, th that sort of feeds into your already uh, uh, psychological predispositions. And so, I mean, it's like it's like a snowball then. That that makes sense. And I wonder if um, I wonder if if we would observe the same phenomenon if uh, back when science and religion were essentially intertwined and mm -hmm. a lot of scientists were monks, right? And and were yeah. priests. And even many scientists from the Enlightenment were also religious. So. Exactly, and looked at uh, science as a way of understanding how God made the universe, you know, just kind yeah. of looking at it from that perspective, still um, uncovering truth and not necessarily trying to uh, hoist, say, the Catholic Church's yeah. idea of what God's universe looked like, but but really trying to uncover how the universe came about. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if if the same rabbit hole existed, or if just that 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 hope of something bigger would you know would would mitigate that somewhat. Maybe not. I mean, maybe not at all. Maybe once you go into that space, it's just a very different space, and. Mm. Um, by the way, now a very interesting question came to my mind while you're, you were saying that. Mm -hmm. When you write something, mm -hmm. I mean, one of your fiction books or whatever, how, how truthful would you say it is in terms of, okay, so what I'm writing is really something that rings true to myself? I don't... I don't know that I could effectively write something that didn't ring true to me, at least on mm. some level. That doesn't mean that I don't look at things from different perspectives as I'm mm -hmm. writing and sort of take on that perspective no. as I'm writing. But it would have to ring true for that perspective. For instance, if I'm writing a character that maybe I wouldn't like so much, you know, someone who is, you know, a dirty, rotten scoundrel for... <laughs> <laughs> for lack of a better way of describing them, right? Um, I really try to look into how they rationalize that to themselves, how they make that a, 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 a truth for themselves that is that doesn't destroy them. Mm. Because that, the does, part, that doesn't destroy the purpose of the character. Uh, no, that doesn't... That, that, Yes, the purpose of the character, definitely, but also that that character, I think that if we are, let's say, a dirty, rotten scoundrel by any objective measure, right, because um, we are, you know, don't care about others, that maybe we have no problem putting others in harm, you know, you, you name it. Yeah. Most people who are of that character, say, objectively, um, still think of themselves as, as okay people, right? I mean, they, they rationalize what they're doing. And if you ask them, um, they would say, well, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a perfectly normal person. In fact, I'm a, I'm, I'm a great person. Right. Um, and that's their truth. I mean, that I hate the term my truth because it's, it's just taken on this pop psychology term. I don't know if you know that term. Um, it's, it's just become ubiquitous here and, and sort of the, the sort of conversation, the cultural conversation, you just hear my, people. Oh, hear my, that, that, that sort of my truth based on your own personal experience. 
exactly exactly yeah. and and what yeah I, I mean a, a sort of completely subjective truth that doesn't yeah. care about uh, exactly. comparing to other people and trying to be objective or anything like that exactly it's it's i think it's very different than when we would say something like well in my experience which i think just by the way that's phrased implies that other people may have a different experience and that that experience may be just as valid right yeah. but i mean one of the reasons why i bristle at my truth is that it, it, it the way it's often deployed and it is deployed is that this is my truth you're not changing my mind because it's my truth there is no other truth and the subjective truth as you said trumps over anything else mm -hmm. and um so I, I guess you know when we're talking about something that rings true it you know it, it like I, I don't think i could ever write a villain who is who thinks of himself or herself as purely evil unless it's some sort of strange supernatural um villain but even in that case it, it seems like the sort of supernatural villains, Satan is a great example. Um, they think they're the greatest villain of all time. You know what I mean? I mean, when it comes to evil, I am so good at this. I am a great evildoer. You know, there's, yeah. there's that sense of, of, um, of attaching your behavior to something bigger than you, better than you, or, you know, elevating, mm -hmm whatever it is that you're doing um, in your own eyes and and then hoping that you're elevating it in the eyes of others. You see that with internet trolls too, right? You know, people who um, love dive bombing conversations with sort of very self-righteous and simplistic comments that are cringy. And, <laughs> and you think to yourself, well, God, if they could just see themselves how most people see them, they would never have come into this conversation and said what they said because it's, you know, reading it is, is painful. You know, even if it's not directed at you, just some of these, these, these comments are just, just cringily painful, right? But of course they don't see that. If they yeah. thought they were being, you know, foolish or ignorant or whatever it is that you that that we want to ascribe to them they they would never do that they they think they're right and not only do they think they're right they think that there is a whole cadre of people who are are you know giving them a standing ovation for what they've said um because maybe a couple of people have pressed like at their, uh, you know <laughs> beneath the button or something like that and actually that's that sort of whole um, internet troll analogy, I think, really works when you're talking about how uh, just people go through life, you know, people, particularly people who have to rationalize some pretty um, egregious behavior. Uh, I think that there is a belief on their part that um, you know, whatever lie they're telling themselves or others is being believed by most. And when they sense that a person isn't believing them, they usually either double down and try to make that person believe them, or they simply back away and they don't want to have anything to do with that person. And they are often unconscious of the fact that a lot of people are just sort of smiling and going along and don't believe necessarily what they're saying. But then, of course, there is, the, the you know, probably a group of people who do and buy it hook, hook line and sinker. But um so anyway going back to the to, to what you asked me about truth um that's where it's a little that's where it's a, i suppose a little complicated but that that I, I, you have to inhabit that space I think as a writer or an artist or or just as a human observer, right? As an interviewer, yeah. certainly. Um, and you have to inhabit that space of, well, of, of that person's whole worldview, basically. And it has to 
ring true to you, not necessarily because that's your own personal experience or your own personal belief, but you can understand how somebody could come to believe what they're believing. Let's put it that way. Does that make sense? Yes. Is that complete? I mean, is that a is that a complete answer, or did I miss something? No, I, I mean, I was I'm I'm trying to uh, I will try to explain why I came up with that question. I mean, because we were talking about Fernando Pessoa, and huh? he has a very interesting poem that in English would be like something like auto psychography. So it's like an mm -hmm. uh, an auto biography about mm -hmm. how we write so something auto psychography so yeah yeah it's it's a, it's an interesting title uh, and he says basically something like uh, uh, the poet is a liar because when he writes about an emotion he's not writing about the emotion itself because when he's writing is uh, first of all he can't really directly expose the emotion in writing and most of the time mm -hmm. when you're writing about an emotion you're not experience you're experiencing it like uh, in the context where it happened so you're writing about the memory of the emotion and then yeah. when the readers uh, read read it the emotion they experience it is their own emotion so, I mean, there's several layers mm -hmm. of what you would call lying uh, in the writing process, let's say. That's an interesting way of looking at it. It's a bit nihilistic, too, because yeah. I don't, I mean, look, a fiction is a lie if you're going to, if you're, I mean, it's made up. I don't know that it's a lie in, if, if you define lying as something um, that someone does i don't lying to me implies something cynical hmm. just by its nature yeah. um and i mean all fiction is I mean, it's a fiction. It's not true, right? It's made up, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's approached cynically by the author. Hmm. Okay, so and what what if instead of lying, it was deceiving? Because because probably that's the best translation of what he says there. Sometimes, um, I would say. For me at least okay more accurately is that what i'm trying to do when i write a fiction is i'm trying to recreate a reality and i'm trying to do it as accurately as possible but in doing that i'm trying to add flourishes that entertain mm -hmm. that tell a larger story the way say a myth might yeah right um and often the story will have some sort of moral component, right? A, a, a sort of moral lesson that I'm exploring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, just a, a general exploration of the way um, a given set of characters that admittedly I've created, right? So that's, that, uh, that's automatically limiting because it's, it's limited to my perceptions. It's, it, you know, it's not some sort of objective reality that I'm creating, right? But, um, but it definitely does force me to consider, at least within the confines of the reality I've created, um, different uh, ways that a, a set of characters that different characters might approach a given situation and how they might behave either admirably or not so. <laughs> um, and to me, at least for me, that is that sort of expands my own um, my own knowledge of, of myself and of others in a limited way, mm -hmm. I think, because it's obviously, like I said, I'm limited by my own experience and perceptions and and by my own intellect for that matter 
Um, but, but it does take me there. It does take me outside of just, you know, the way I might think about um, these things just going through my day-to-day -day life because I don't usually stop and think and have the time to, to reflect in that way. I, I'm, I'm reacting more from the hip, you know? Um, so, I, I mean, deceiving, I guess, sometimes there's a bit of, of conscious trickery involved where, where as a writer you're thinking, oh, well, wouldn't it be interesting if um, this character be, you know, behaved in such a way that is, that is um, not, uh, not expected, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, if I think of deception, really, I, I, I mean, we've talked about Lolita before, but um, Nabokov's Lolita, Lolita, I think, is so brilliantly deceptive. Yeah. But I, I mean that in the, in the best way, because here he is, um, his, his main character is this, this shit, is this pedophile, but, and you just look at the conversation around the leader. You have so many people who, who think that he's somehow condoning the behavior because he's allowing this man to speak. Mm -hmm. And yet by allowing this man to speak, he reveals him for the shady character that he is at the same time. And that isn't, that's trickery. I mean, it, it is deceptive, but it's also fantastic and it's beautiful and it, it inspires us to really look carefully at this villain and his his behavior and see everything from ourselves to our neighbors in it and that that can be really disturbing and i think that that sort of uh that sort of play is is important and is instrumental in our understanding ourselves. And I think it, it has a real part in the cultural conversation. A lot of people would disagree, right? I don't want anyone reading Lolita, but um, that's, I guess that's where, I guess that's where I come from. I, I guess all writers are deceptive and that we all deceive ourselves to some extent, right? So even if we're trying not to be deceptive, even if we're trying to really create some kind of incredible truth, um, it's very difficult for us to uh, separate ourselves from our own self-deception. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. So, I mean, talking about characters. Yeah. Since you've been, since you started writing fiction, did it change anything for you in terms of how you think and view people that are different from you? because you've also been trying to create characters that perhaps differ from you, at least to a certain extent. I mean, because uh, I don't write fiction myself. I mean, I do it with when I'm in love, but <laughs> that's an interesting thing in and of itself. But anyway, let's leave, let's leave that aside for now. Uh, but uh, I've, I've studied personality psychology and I've been talking with personality psychologists and I mean what I what I got from it is two different things two opposite things in in fact one of them is that I became much more tolerant of different people because I understand that people differ and most of the major ways they differ among themselves are things that they don't really have any sort of control over so most of it is genetic what is not genetic is things that happen in their lives i mean experiences they have which right. which they don't also don't have any control over and uh, but then on the other hand i mean sometimes i can get a little bit desperate because i also have a much clearer sense of the limitations in trying to understand someone who is sufficiently different from you. So if someone has personality traits that makes them differ from you enough, then even if uh, you can have uh, an intellectual understanding 
of the mental experiences of that person, since you don't experience life the same way, there's also, I mean, knowing that also interestingly sort of creates more space between the two of you, you know, because you also have in mind that, okay, this is something that the person is like that, she is different from me in this and that aspect. I, I get it, she can tell me how she thinks about the world, how she sees things, and I can understand it intellectually, but since I can't experience it myself, there's always, I mean, that growing space between us, because it's very clear that there are things that, I mean, we can use words to try to talk about them to each other, but we don't really understand them. Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely, first of all, I think the reason why I've always been interested in storytelling and fiction even more than nonfiction, although I love nonfiction, um, is because it allows me to go farther than just the facts I'm presented with. It allows me to imagine, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine how someone else is feeling. Imagine being in a, a, a place or a country that I've never been to, but that I have to research and then imagine myself on the streets of, of that that place, or my character rather, um, who is a, an extension of myself to some extent. Um, I think that it also safely allows me to play with aspects of, you know, of human behavior that are dangerous or, um, cruel, whatever, what, you know, whatever, however, we absolutely don't want to behave in our own lives, right? But, and, and we, at least we hope not to. And so, you know, have I, do, do I feel like it's expanded kind of my understanding of others and maybe my tolerance? Absolutely, without question. And it's, I, I've seen that grow from the time when I was a kid. Um, that something that started out as, as mere curiosity, even skepticism, uh, changed, you know, it changed my heart. It changed the way I, I saw somebody else or, or a, a group of people. And I, I mean, I just, I love that process. I love the process of, of, of expansion in that sense. I mean, that one of the reasons why, you know, I was talking to someone about um, you know, why to have kids, and this was a few years ago. Yeah. And yeah. I, I said, well, you know, I mean, it, it kind of depends on who you are, you know, we're having that, that conversation. But for me personally, it has so expanded my, um, my cultural knowledge, my self-knowledge, it has forced me to sort of, it, not to be the, the person who, um, it, you know, it's so easy to become that person as we get older, you know, you, you look at what young people are doing and be like, well, young people these days, right? But when you have young people in your house and you love these young people, you kind of have to force yourself to see things entirely from their point of view to, at least to some extent, and then hopefully also um, impart your own wisdom and experience to them and maybe temper their, their you know, youthful perceptions with, with your own experience um, without trying to destroy their youthful perceptions, right? Without trying to destroy what they're trying to create for their generation. And I think writing characters is a lot like that. It's a lot like, like birthing and raising a child in a sense, because you are you know, you, you, you have a love for what you've created because you've put so much effort into it. And you have hopes and dreams for this character, just as you have hopes and dreams for your own family, you know, for your own kids, for the people you love. Um, and of course, for, you know, for yourself. And so, 
you know, that's a, I think that's a tremendously motivating force, at least for me as a writer, that, um, that investment. And just, I think for me at least, the nature of, of having that kind of investment in a character automatically makes you more tolerant of that character's foibles. And then that extends beyond that. I think that's why, I mean, you and I have talked about how we are sort of um, somewhat politically homeless because we, we, we're, uh, we're, I mean, I, I guess centrists. I mean, I don't know how else to describe it, but, you know, we're able to look at both sides of an issue. We're able to talk to people who yeah. are even yeah. on far sides of the issue and have a perfectly reasonable conversation, even a friendship with people mm -hmm. who maybe we disagree very strongly with on some issues. And I, I, and maybe that's an innate personality trait, but it's definitely um, supported by what I do, if that makes sense. It's probably an innate personality trait for me. It's, it's something that, that uh, you know, I've, I've certainly been this way kind of for as long as I can remember, but, um, but, being a writer helps it just helps me not to become calcified i guess yeah it certainly <laughs> must have something to do with openness to experience i mean because openness to experiences to experience is also associated with intellectual interests and artistic interests and so on and basically people who are open to experience are also people who like to uh to deal or being exposed to different kinds of people and hear different ideas and stuff like that. So definitely, and it's not just with different characters. I think uh, just different genres of fiction help you do that. You know, they help you explore different parts of, um, of you know, your own character and just character in general. I, I mean, we're near Halloween here. I know this is going to come out much later than than on Halloween, but um, but the horror genre. I think yeah. it's a really interesting genre. You know, it's it's deeply spiritual sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, at least if you're dealing with ghosts, for instance, or demonic possession or, or any of that. Um, but it's, it also, I mean, it takes us to that place of what would we do if the worst possible thing happened to us? Right. You know, romance, I think, is, is the opposite. That's what would we do if the best possible thing happened to us? How would that look? Yeah. Right? But, um, I mean, one of the reasons why, I, I mean, I'm not like a big horror movie fan or anything like that. I'm not even a big horror fan. I, I'm kind of like, oh, I don't like blood and guts so much um, on the screen. But, but I love the horror genre. I mean, I have a deep respect for it. And when um, a great, uh, you know, when, when, I've read a lot of great horror stories, obviously classics like Dracula and Frankenstein and um, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, I don't think, you know, I was trying to remember if I think I read The Invisible Man when I was young, but I just don't remember. I think I'll have to reread that if, I'm pretty sure I read it. I'll have to read it again. But um, I, I love where that genre takes me. Maybe because I am such a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, it, 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 sh it takes us to a place where we are, you know, forced to grapple with when things go tragically wrong. Mm -hmm. And that um, with the whole concept that we could do the right thing, we could be the hero, and we still end up with an axe in our head. Mm-hmm. Um, which other genres tend, you know, tend not to explore that. And it's something that I think is very, uh, very rooted in, in, in horror. And so anyway, you know, we can, we can, it's, it's almost like a, a Russian doll effect, right? Because we can explore fiction in general, like in general literary fiction, where we're talking about the human condition and, and, and a, a novel might, might um, include a wide range, you know, like 
like um, East of Eden, you know, John Steinbeck's East of Eden, something like that might include a wide range of behaviors, or we can explore human behavior through genre and really uh, kind of zero in on um, how we might behave under a certain set of certs excuse me, certain set of circumstances, whether, you know, we are being chased by a horrible monster in a horror movie, or um, we are in sci-fi and we're having to deal with possible worlds and completely alien environments and aliens in general, and we're taken out of our comfort zone in that, or romance where we're dealing with right, what we hope for most in our lives of, of connecting with another person so completely and feeling that euphoric sense of being in love and um, and things all falling into place because of that, right? Um, you know, that, all of those, all of those are, I think, terrific ways of exploring who we are and why, and also understanding how our own lives unfold in this sort of three act structure, which I think they do. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, and, and, you know, I'm firmly in act two of my life, right? I have been married for 20 years. I have children. I'm working. I'm taking care of a mom, my mom who lives with us and who is ill and, and, is experiencing some pretty significant uh, mental decline. Mm -hmm. So, and and I'm I also happen to be writing the second book in this big sort of historical fantasy romance epic, epic, right? That series. And I I was just talking to my editor yesterday, and I was realizing as I was talking to her because you know the second book in a series is Act Two, right? And that is the hardest to write. Mm -hmm. that it can get muddled. Um, you are having to reference, say, either the first act, if it's a, let's say we're talking about a novel, just like one novel, or the first book in a series, so that people who pick up the second book don't have to, you know, they can read it as a standalone. And you don't have, you know, and, and you have to remind them also, even if they read the first book, you have to remind them of what happened in the first book to some extent, but without being repetitive, right? Or again, if it's a standalone novel, you have to remind them about what happened in the, in the first act. But you also have to foreshadow what's going to happen towards the end of this right. story right. Um, so that they can follow along. And it, that is so, I, I mean, it, it's just, it, it, it so re reflects our own experience, I think, because that's exactly where I am in my life. I'm in that middle place. I'm in act two, where um, certain things that are happening in my life certainly foreshadow what may or may not occur in in the latter part of my life, you know, where I'm my, when I'm my mother's age and my children are having to care for me or to some extent, maybe not have them have me live with them, but just, you know, they have to watch out for me somehow. Um, and yet I'm still in that place where I'm, I'm young enough and I, I also am constantly referencing what happened in, my, in the first part of my life when I was going to school, traveling, falling in love and starting my family. Yeah. So, you know, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm it, it, it's sort of like what came first, the chicken or the egg and I, I have to imagine that the three act structure when um, when it for, you know when it was first when Aristotle was first thinking about three act structure um, that it was it was more an observation of how we live our lives and again that whole that a reflection of how we live our lives but it's not absolute truth obviously because we don't always live our lives in a very neat um neat way where the story ties up with a nice bow but to some extent it does tie up with a nice bow because we all die i mean that's something that's going to happen to every single one of us that's how the story ends no matter what we die it just depends on how we die or whether we believe in an afterlife 
Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just thinking, going back a little bit to the horror genre, uh, I mean, I was just thinking that it's interesting that, at least for me, what terrifies me the most in stories is not exactly those sort of supernatural elements, like, for example, I don't know, weird creatures, predators, and stuff like that. It's, uh, I mean, the, the stories that I, found, I find the most horrifying are not horror stories themselves, but stories where there's uh, existential elements that are horrifying. So, for example, yeah. um, the Silence Trilogy by Ingmar Bergman. I mean, three movies. The first one, Through a Glass Darkly, is basically about a writer who doesn't really establish a real relationship with his daughter. I mean, his daughter has even some mental issues because of that, and he explores the fact that he can be in touch directly with his daughter who is experiencing this mental distress, and he, he uses that for writing his fiction. I mean, he doesn't really care about his daughter, he only cares about um, having direct exposure to someone who's living a mental illness and then taking some material from that to write his books. And then the second movie, whose title I can't really remember now, but if you just search uh, the, the Silence yeah. Trilogy, it will pop up immediately. It's basically about, um, about a priest who no longer believes in God. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's the gist of it. And then the third movie is where things really get completely messed up because it's about uh, two sisters living together, one of them as a boy, and they don't even speak the same language. I mean, as far as I remember, they don't even speak any language that exists. So, I mean, they, sp they speak something. I, 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 I'm not completely sure, but I think the movie doesn't even have uh, subtitles nor anything like that. So if, they, if, if any of them speak Swedish, at least I don't recall uh, the movie having subtitles. So probably it's not even Swedish and they speak two different languages. So the thing there is that uh, they've fallen so far apart that they can no longer communicate and the way Bergman exposes that is that they don't even share the same language. So it's the extreme representation of not being able to communicate at all. And I mean, th those are the sort of things that really scare the shit out of, out of me because the most terrifying things for me in life are those sorts of things of losing meaning and particularly not being able to communicate with someone even if you think that you're doing it as clearly as possible, which I imagine in that case both sisters fought that. So, I mean... It's, it's sort of things let, that lead to isolation, so. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, um, first, that's just brilliant. To, that the, and, and I think you're right. I think those are horror stories, even though there's no real supernatural element to them at all. And, and they are not presented as horror stories. But no, they, no, but so I they, think they, are. they completely scare the shit out of me. So. Me, me too. Um, I because I was, I've always thought about writing a horror story and what would a horror story be like. Because I've, I've, I am sort of enchanted by the the um, the story of how Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, right? 
that's always been very compelling to me that it was a, a contest between her and her highfalutin friends back in, I don't know, like 1819 or something like that. They're in Geneva and they're all deciding how, that they're going to scare the pants off of each other and they're each going to write a horror story and and you know it was like Lord Byron and, and all these people writing horror stories and she won the mother load with Frankenstein and and um and it and, and I think that Frankenstein is truly psychological horror but I think the reason why I could never well not I could never but I I have not been able to write sit down and, and write a horror story is because the thing that I'm most afraid of is estrangement yeah. Like you, and it's. I, I mean, so I don't. I don't know if this is just my personality or not, but <laughs> it's it's really the fact that the thing I find most terrifying, most of all, I mean, forget uh, snakes and spiders and yeah. all of those <laughs> things. I, I mean, those are things for uh, to scare children for me. So I mean. It, things having to do with not being able to tell another person what you want to tell and uh, communication breaking down and loneliness and isolation. I mean, those are the things that really scare me the most. Me too. I, I mean, I, so I guess... So terrifying that... to me, actually, that they like almost render me speechless because when I really sit down, as I did just a moment ago when I like couldn't summon a word is that I was kind of going to that place of really sitting with a feeling of isolation and estrangement. And it is, it's, it, it, it's overwhelmingly terrifying to me. Yeah. Um, and I, I try to imagine sitting, you know, sitting down and, and writing a story that really does deeply explore. I mean, I definitely explore estrangement in my own work, but I mean, to explore it that deeply, I don't, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that right now in my life that I have the courage for that because there's just maybe too, too much else going on. But then on the other hand, if I could do nothing but sit around and think about my fear of estrangement, I think I'd go mad. <laughs> sense because yeah. I just I think that that is such an incredibly overwhelming it's not even an emotion it's a state I mean it's I, I can't for the life of me imagine a, a state of complete estrangement I understand why exile was the ultimate punishment at yeah. one point. You know, if you were exiled from your community, it was like... Um, uh, it I mean, was there, like you condemning... Were, you, you were killing that person. They, yeah. You were killing that person. But but even in a worse way than being, I mean, just just shot in the head or... Or, or crucified like or whatever. I, I yeah, would rather... Yeah. That's it. I, I mean, I think exile, it, it, it's, it is so cold. It's so cruel. You know, it, you know, it's why you walk, you make somebody walk the plank for heaven's sake. That is so horrifying. You make I someone mean, go I mean, alone guess. into the sea and die there alone. You know, those are the most horrifying things to me. I mean, I guess it's no wonder that in countries where uh, when someone is in prison and they, they put them in isolation, I mean, in the United States, you have cases like that. In Portugal, fortunately, as far as I'm aware, we don't have any of, the, of that. But I mean, people get so messed up that they do anything to get out of there. They even cut yeah. themselves open. And I mean, they do whatever just yeah. for people to take them out of there. It's, a, it's absolute horror and misery. Yeah. I think so, too. I think that that um, that estrangement, I mean, it's at the root of well, it's at the root, I think, of any self-harm, you know, yeah. not just something like suicide. You yeah. know, I think people who kill themselves are trying to end their own isolation, <laughs> even though that's the ultimate isolation, going off into the unknown by yourself. But somehow that feels better than feeling 
alone in a group of people, you know, or feeling estranged yeah. from your loved ones, your community, you know, because feeling useless in that regard, you know, mm -hmm. and Yeah, I mean, I'm even afraid, I mean, as you were telling me about the Ingmar Bergman series, I'd heard of it, I'd never seen it, um, but I, I, I hadn't, you know, I'm trying to remember if I ever even heard it described to me, because that is, that would be very difficult. I would love to watch them, but it would be very difficult for me to watch. You know, I was thinking about um, the middle one, the one you can remember the, the title of, about the priest who's lost faith in God. I try yeah. to imagine yeah. having given up everything, yeah. Having given up having a family, a, a partner, um, submitting uh, submitting to an order, you know, mm -hmm. and and then losing faith. I, that's that's horrifying. Yeah. Absolutely horrifying. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have to tell you, if I, if I lie down at night and start thinking about those things, I mean, I can't sleep. I, I, oh. ju I just can't. I get, I, get, I get so, so, so terrified that I basically spend the rest of the night just in complete mental turmoil. So, uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, I, I can't do it. And then, and then, and then I start imagining death and what would be to no longer be here and stuff like that. And I mean, it's it gets it's overwhelming. It's it gets completely messed up. Completely yeah. and very, very fast. I mean, I I really go downhill very fast if I if I even try to try to venture myself into those kinds of thoughts when I'm trying to sleep. So, well, and the night is such an interesting time, especially for up in the night. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, not only is it because, you know, everything's sort of, you know, we're lying down, our, 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 our blood sugar is all wonky because we're not eating. And, and, yeah. and you know, there's, and I think we all have a, a witching hour if we're up in the night where, um, oh, my dog has come. I'm going to have to put him on my lap. Um, <laughs> otherwise, he will just, this is Barney. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, he will just make make life too difficult for me. He'll make noise because uh, he does not like estrangement. Yeah. But, I, but I remember, you know, when I first had my son, I mean, he's now 19. Uh, he I, I truly felt like I did not sleep for the first four months of his life because he was just up and wanted to feed all the time and mm -hmm. i was also a new mother and i wasn't used to not being able to sleep all night and so it was it was a it was a big adjustment and it was and i mean i was i was really i i was so um sleep deprived that i remember i was driving and i stopped at a red light and yeah people kept honking and honking and honking at me. And I was like, God, what is your problem? And I was like, oh, the light must have turned green. But then I realized it wasn't a red light. It was a stop sign. And then people still kept honking. And I'm like, what is their problem? I stopped at the stop sign. And then I realized there was no stop sign. I'd stopped in the middle of the street. Oh. I thought I was at a red light. Then I thought I was at a stop sign. And then I realized, oh my God, I, you know, I was, I was actually having um, sort of delusions, you know, I was, yeah. I was, you know, and, and I came home and I told my husband, I was like, I can't drive anymore until I get some sleep because, you know, and I told him what happened. But anyway, what was so interesting about that time was um, the night became so lonely to me and it had never been a lonely time for me because usually when I was up at night, it was because I was up having fun or I was up writing, I was doing something. So it felt sublime. But this was, it felt like everyone was getting sleep but me. <laughs> I mean, it just, that's what it felt like. 
and you know, and, and yet, and I was also having to care for a new baby all night and the baby can't really communicate with you except they can only communicate their needs because they, they, you know, they're not talking. They're not even smiling at this point. They're just brand new. And I, you know, I felt so, so isolated and so much so that my days were great. I mean, I, I didn't have like postpartum depression or anything during the day. I was having, I was tired, <laughs> but my days were fine. And right when the sun started to set, I started to sob uncontrollably. This was like the first six weeks of my son's life. And it was the craziest thing. And really until the sun was setting, I would say, you know, this is great. I've had a great day. I'm not going to, I'm not going to fall into that hot mess that I am. And I, I was like a werewolf. It was the craziest thing. And then the sun would go down and suddenly I would, I couldn't control myself. I would start to sob and I would sob and I would sob and I would sob for like an hour and a half. And then I was okay again. But then the whole night I wouldn't sleep and I felt that sense of isolation. And I remember describing it to a friend of mine who has since committed suicide. Ooh. And I remember her saying, that's how every day feels for me. And I can't remember a time when it didn't. And this was a close friend and I felt like I was a close friend and I felt like she enjoyed, like we enjoyed each other. We'd known each other since we were little kids. I don't even remember a time when I didn't know her and when we didn't hang out and we would laugh together, you know, and all this. And it was just, it was so devastating for me to hear that this was her whole life. That even when she was laughing, she felt this way. She felt so estranged and isolated and, um, it, it, you know, indeed, her life ended in a in a horror horror show. I mean, she jumped in front of a train. Yeah. And w what could be a bit greater horror story than that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, th that's that's very intense. Uh, I mean, I, I can tell you. Uh, I've I've been going on and off depression since I was seventeen. So more or more or less 14 years now right. and when i'm going through a peak of it i mean it can get uh, it can get to something like this i mean you know you know like when you have when you have a nightmare and you wake up from it and you're shaking all yes. over <laughs> And yes. you turn on the light and you know there's nothing there and it was only a bad dream and blah, blah, blah. But yes. that doesn't change anything because you're still shaking the hell yeah. out of you. And I mean, yeah. and it's as real as it can be. And I mean, you and even sometimes you can be there one two hours and this and the sensation is if it is if you're still in the night in the damn nightmare, in the nightmare. you're right yeah. and even if you've actually forgotten the details of the nightmare yeah. that feeling stays with you yeah yeah you forgot the the details but it's mm -hmm. as if you remember them at the same time because <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's as if you lived them yeah, yeah. Be because you're scared of something you don't know right. exactly what but you right. know you're fucking scared of something yeah, exactly. uh, down to your bones or i mean it's it's terrifying and i and i mean at the peak of depression it can be something like uh waking up in the morning feeling like complete shit yeah. and then i mean going through the entire day i, I mean i i have the i had this one time where i spent I, I i spent my old days uh, having the sensation that i was trembling yeah and then i stood my hand out and it was normal but I still had the sensation that I was trembling all over. And if someone looked at me, I was just 
I mean, static, normal, right? I mean, and as I said, I just, just to make sure of it, I stick my hand out and it's, it's normal, it's not shaking, but I, 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 it's that feeling that I'm in complete emotional turmoil and that your body is completely falling apart and then and then you you don't have any appetite at all you don't want to eat uh, sleeping i mean if you get through five six hours of sleep it's almost a miracle because you can wake up at five 6 a.m. if you're not used to that and then just still can't get up of uh, uh, can't get out of bed but being there for two or three more hours uh, feeling like you're going to die or something like that uh, but but uh, but yeah again Again, the, the worst of all and the thing that worsens all the symptoms is the idea that I'm feeling all of these. There's no apparent reason for it, but I'm still feeling it. I can't really communicate this to anyone else and sometimes it it gets even worse because uh, you don't want to bother other people with it. And then, and then the feeling of isolation intensifies and then it's on and on and on and on again like this. And yeah, you, you can very, very easily get into a situation of extreme and absolute despair and there's absolutely no other solution in your mind except ending these for good. So, I mean, because it's, it's, it's unbearable. It's completely unbearable. Yeah. Can you identify what, make, what makes that break? You know what I mean? What, can you identify the point when you start to crawl out of that? I mean, it's it's a bit complicated. The, the, uh, the uh, okay, so different things. So different things can happen. Uh, there were things where uh, when it just went away, all of a so all of a sudden. I mean, I I, can, I can't really explain. Where you know where you just yeah. quite literally wake up and you're better. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, right. Th that happened to me. Then there were other situations where, um, I mean, just something happened in my life that uh, made me feel that I wasn't isolated anymore. Like, for example, I mean, th that, uh, that happened... I think that that happened for all the relationships I've had. When, when I met someone new and we started a relationship, that usually was one of the triggers for the depression to end. At least uh, for the, in the short term, let's say. Yeah. So that, that's another one of the things that helped me. Uh, I mean, the, the, there were other extreme, extreme situations where uh, I really had to get um, psychiatric help. And yeah, the, that, that also helps a little, but at least for me personally, it never helped as much as being able to uh, develop some sort of relationship with someone where I don't feel isolated anymore. So. It's very, I, I, um, how did you do during COVID? Uh, well, I mean, you know, it's interesting because during COVID, I didn't get depressed at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
That what? is interesting. Y yeah, 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 it is. Uh, yeah. And is it because you were you weren't is you weren't isolated from people, or maybe everyone else was sort of isolated too, and you were still connected with you know the same? You know, I don't know. I'm just okay. trying to. Yeah. Okay. So per perhaps one of the reasons was that because everyone was at home. Yeah. Uh, and because everyone was so eager to talk to other people uh, all the time they could get to do it, prob yeah. probably uh, and paradoxically people were more available to you <laughs> than in, in, normal, in the normal context. I, gu I guess, I mean, I don't know how it was for other people, but uh, yeah, I, I get... At least I got that impression, yeah. I did too. And I think that in some respects, and it'll be interesting to see how it changes how we live our lives, you know, in the modern world, because yeah. increasingly we're all living very similar lives, right? I mean, it used to be that somebody living in Indiana lived, you know, a very different life than somebody living on the outskirts of Lisbon. Mm. It, it, at least superficially right um the way but in, increasingly everything is very similar between all of us because we're all interconnected yeah and yeah. we all start to sort of migrate towards certain behaviors uh you know because of oh, technology oh. because of all sorts of reasons right but and i i wonder if with covid because i think we all did sort of we spent more time with our families yeah we had to reach out more, even though we were very isolated and we couldn't go out and have a good time, you know, in, in a group, that part of it was gone, but we were forced to find more meaning, I guess. We were yeah. forced to make our, to make it work where yeah. we were. And that's not such a bad thing because uh, I think we we're, we're so, it's so easy in the modern world to be dr driven to distraction, you know, but not be building internal reserves, which are so necessary to keep us from despair, especially those of us who, um, who whose personalities trend can, can trend towards despair, yeah. you know, that's our nature. Okay, so I, I'm going to tell you another thing, because on the other hand, I guess that, uh, the fact that nowadays uh, with modern technology we can be 24 7 connected to others i mean that has uh, pros and cons the pros yes. are the things we've already talked about because i mm -hmm. mean it's very easy for you to just pick up the phone or open f um, facebook messenger or whatsapp or whatever and right. and and message your friend or someone from your family or whatever and I mean, have a most, uh, more or less immediately available person to talk with. Um, but on the other hand, it's interesting, particularly when you're talking about, for example, romantic relationships, because I'm starting to question if it's really good to have means of communicating with people 24 7 and and sure. and and, and building relationships on the premise that that person must in theory be, be available to talk to you 24 7. i mean and uh, and again i think that this might boil down to a question of personality because it, particularly for people who have insecure attachment styles and mm -hmm. are high on neuroticism. Yeah. It's I like mean, a drug. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. it, it's a drug that when it works, it's great. When it doesn't work, uh, it can very quickly mess you up. Like, for example, let's say that you're in a new relationship and you live apart and then you're used to, I don't know, 
two or three <laughs> times a day message the other person and she replies immediately or like five minutes later. Let's say that uh, you're so in awe with the, with the entire situation that one day you message her and you're even careful about doing it uh, more or less at the time you know she is usually available and then suddenly she's offline and she takes five hours to reply back. You know, right. you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, <laughs> and by the way, she might she might be thinking, I'm not going to be quite so available to him. I think I'm going to wait to answer because she's also trying to to balance yeah. whether she should be so available, not just to you, say, or to, to her, to whoever, mm -hmm. but emotionally. You know, of, I of oh, I'm getting too addicted to this. And I mean, I don't even know what I would have done if this had been around when I was dating. Yeah. Because we couldn't. And I mean, and my husband and I on top of it had a long distance relationship for yeah. two years before um, we were able to live in the same city. We, you know, so we could only see each other on weekends every other weekend, you know? And I, I, I try to think about if, you know, what would that have looked like if at any time we could text each other? You know, the way I look at how my kids and their friends communicate, no. it's, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy. And it, it, we have completely, in, in, in the span of just a few years, we have completely revolutionized how we communicate. And we wonder why we're kind of going nuts, right? Yeah. <laughs> Trying to adapt to this. I mean, I, you know, I was telling, telling my kids that there was this place that we called the swamp when I was a teenager. It was yeah. a church parking lot. There was nothing swamp-like about it, right? But we called it the swamp because, you know, pre-driving rebels would all re meet there to smoke cigarettes, you know, and, and, and be cool. And they don't have a swamp yeah. because they've yeah. got social media. Yeah. So they're sending each other memes and they're doing it all virtually. And that's a not so subtle change. And the change in dating, I mean, the fact that people meet on dating sites often instead of through friends or at a bar or, or at, a, at a wedding, you know, um, and that that's completely normalized. That's how most people meet. It's almost like, um, like arranged marriages or something because you're, because, you know, you're, you're meeting based on what you're seeing pretty much written down about the person, what this person is saying about themselves. And then, you know, you kind of have to read through that and figure out if what they're saying about themselves fits with what you need and also what you're saying about yourself. It's, it's a Russian doll. I mean, all of yeah. this is just such a Russian doll. And I wonder too, I mean, I wonder how it's changing fiction. Mm hmm um, it, on one hand, I see it, it, that like genre fiction is, is just bigger than ever because it's easily digestible. There's a formula to it. It's yeah. quick to get through it. Um, but then like the podcast, right, which is really long form, it's a meandering conversation. Yeah. Um, you have these gigantic fantasy epics that people are devouring. I mean, who'd have thunk that, I mean, we're talking about Game of Thrones last time, I think. Um, I mean, who'd have thought that something like that could possibly capture the imagination of so many people because it's so complicated. It's such a complicated story. And it was even made less complicated, obviously, for television. But, um, but the books are hugely popular. The television show, which was more pop, more complicated than most television shows, um, was hugely popular. And um, it's, I don't know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think at least what I see is that kids are, um, young people tend to be, 
getting into reading later, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If at all. Right. I don't yeah. know. I don't, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing necessarily. It's just different. And, um, we, you know, we're having to deal on so many levels with how, um, thank God, was that my stomach growling? Um, it, we're having to deal with so many levels on this massive change in, in the way we relate to one another in our, on how we communicate, our communication style. Yeah. It's, it's kind of mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've also been th been thinking about um, I, I mean, it's it's interesting how people I mean, and I mean, I, I, they're right to a great extent, like, for example, when you read people like Steven Pinker and they come up with all the statistics about how the world is better in so many ways than it was mm -hmm. a few decades ago or a hundred years ago or whatever. I mean, yeah, I, I get that and uh, that's all right. But, there, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, there are some new things that I'm not completely sure are really better than they were before, or at least they are better in some ways, but worse in others. So, for example, going back to the romantic relationships, yeah, probably before, I mean, women had less liberty and there was more domestic violence and stuff like that. I mean, I'm not completely sure because probably you wouldn't get good statistics about that from a few decades ago about how, to what extent people were satisfied with their relationships or not. But on the other hand, nowadays it seems that even though people have many more people to pick up from, uh, <laughs> this many many people seem to be dissatisfied all the time I if, you, think if you know if you, if you know right. if you know what i mean i mean it, I it's it's like your brain particularly because people nowadays most of them live in cities that are much bigger than the old time villages yeah. or towns or whatever yeah. like big cities and we also have the internet and so on, which also expands the circle of people we mm -hmm. virtually have access to. I mean, the brain seems to be so overwhelmed with so many people that supposedly you can choose <laughs> that, that it's, it seems that, that, that when you think that having having more options really makes you happier, it doesn't, because <laughs> because, because many people can't settle and and I mean I'm not I'm not saying that that's bad for all people because yeah there are there are most definitely people out there that prefer short term relationships, casual sex, and they are highly socio sexual. I mean whatever that. But for sure. perfectly okay if that works for them, fine. But many people don't settle, but they don't seem to be happy with it. So, I think you're right. I think that it's not. I, I think most people do want to make a connection with somebody else, and they want it to be a specific person. Not everybody, obviously. There are people who are clearly comfortable with polyamory, for instance. Yeah. But um, I think they're in the minority. Oh, and, oh, yeah, yeah. And I, in a I, serious minority, a very small minority, because that's, I, I, you know, it's it's hard enough to, um, it's hard enough to maintain a relationship with one person. You know, my, my, my husband's father, who's, you know, passed away a long time ago, but he was always so funny because, you know, he, he, he was talking about, um, like, the idea of having a, a mistress, you yeah. know, and he goes, I don't get it. Why would you want two of them? 
<laughs> that's, oh, that, that's you funny. more than one, one woman in your life. It's hard enough with one. It's, it's really a funny way to look at it. And I think that when yeah. you really look at the reality of the situation, it's true. I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine having to deal with more than one relationship for any extended period of time. Oh, would, and, and, and look, polyamorous person, people certainly have their share of bad things in their relationships. Because, yeah. I mean, I, I've heard certain people saying that, I don't know, for example, a guy with three women, and they basically have a, a weekly schedule to meet with each other. And I was just like, what? That would be a fucking nightmare, man. That's what? nuts to me. What? A weekly schedule where, okay, so on Tuesday I will be with Elena, on Wednesday I will be with Victoria, on Thursday I will... Yeah. What? Oh my no! <laughs> what? No, that's that's uh, that would drive me nuts immediately. It's, it's one of those things to quote, like it, it, you know, the title of one of David Foster Wallace's um, pieces, a supposedly fun thing that I never want to do again. You know, when he wrote about going on a cruise <laughs> in the cruise industry, <laughs> that's exactly how I feel about. Um, is some of these more you know alternative lifestyles it's like one of those it's it's like a commune a supposedly fun thing i never want to do again i don't want to live on a commune you know um it's I, I, it's interesting that we're revisiting all of these things and all of these concepts and um i, and, uh, and, I don't and, know and, i think i think the, you know the main way that we find meaning in our lives is by connecting with others i mean we're we're social animals and so it's it's i, I suppose you can find meaning by connecting with people in in spurts but yeah you know and I, I guess spoken like somebody who who wants to sit down and write three uh, you know three or four hundred page story i'm a deep diver <laughs> i i like to um to me what's exciting isn't the novelty of it because the novelty it's all the same it becomes all the same um to me the deep dive is really getting to know other people other human beings and really kind of listening to them because that's and obviously you're that that type too because otherwise you wouldn't have an interview show yeah. um but you know because listening to people beyond small talk is really interesting. Yeah. You know, even people that, who you, you might not think are that interesting when you first meet them, because I don't know, maybe whatever they do for a living doesn't excite you, or um, they don't have the, uh, an effervescent personality or, or, or whatever it might be. When you get an opportunity to really sit down with those people and listen to them, or, or, or if you happen to hear them talking to somebody else, you know, and, and, and it's, it's deeply interesting and you learn about yourself and you learn also that, you know, maybe someone that you judged a certain way is quite different than what you expected, you know, and, and I, uh, I find that very exciting as having my mind changed. It's painful. You don't always like it, especially if you're attached to an idea, right? Yeah. A, a, not just about a person, but just an idea in general. But when you submit to that process and you allow yourself to think about something another way, it, it, it's like the gift that keeps on giving because it, it, um, it takes you through a different door when you've been sitting in the same damn room for I don't know how long, and that room is really comforting, and you might like all the things that you have in that room, but oh my God, suddenly here you are, <laughs> somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, t talking about what we were just mentioning a second ago, I mean, how, uh, how else would you explain things like... Um, 
hearing a lot of feminists complaining about men and things like the incel movement. I, I mean, because I, I'm not sure to what extent people are really that aware of what they really need in life. Because, for example, um, you get uh, women in their 40s that have a career and so on and they and they're single and some of them say that yeah they they are satisfied with their lives and and so on but then as i said you also get lots of women who turn to radical feminism or something like that and are blaming men all the time and saying that men are this or that and then the incel movement and mctow and others saying that women are shit and I mean, because you you I mean you can do you can do something. Yeah, I mean you can you can you can decide that uh, those sorts of relationships are something that don't real doesn't really matter in your life. But I but I mean, can you? Really, that, that's the question, because, I mean, many people try to do it and it simply doesn't work. Of course, you can also become a Buddhist monk if you want and renounce to all worldly pleasures and it includes that. But, I mean, what I'm trying to, to say is that there are many, many people out there that try to deny forcefully that uh, certain kinds of relationships are not that important in their lives, but then, right. but then, it's not really true because otherwise they wouldn't be complaining all the time. So. Exactly, they just ignore it. I think they're desperately important, and that we all need each other. Yeah. You know, and it's it's not just a romantic need. I mean, you can be a gay man who needs women. In your sure. life, you have sisters, you have a mother, yeah. you might have a daughter. You know, um, it, you know, it's 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 what we see. How we've realized now that we have so many um, single mothers, and you know, God, I mean, single mothers work very hard and all of that. But we need men. Yeah, children need a male figure in their lives and close in their lives. They need a father figure. And without that, they're at a disadvantage. It's not to say that they can't grow up and be perfectly fine people, but it's it's harder. You know, we we are we we bring we each bring something to the party. Yeah. And you know, in the same way that I think that uh, progressives need conservatives and vice versa. We need each other in order to balance each other out. And when um, either an institution or a culture, whatever it is, becomes too heavy towards one of those, uh, to one of those sides, it's lopsided and you feel it. You feel like it's off. Yeah. And um, similarly, you know, I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think that there are a lot of uh, unhappy people out there who, who are, um, angry because they've decided to, I don't know, maybe renounce that part of their lives because maybe because they have been unsuccessful in that part of their lives instead of, uh, and renunciation maybe is easier than self-reflection sometimes because it, you know, self-reflection can bring us to really painful places. You know, we were talking about estrangement and how estrangement is so painful for me. You know, I, I understand that. I understand being just saying to yourself, I, I can't, I can't go there. So it's easier for me to hate women or hate men or yeah. you know, hate the other side, whatever that other side is. Yeah. Well, I, anyway, let, <laughs> let's try to change topic. <laughs> Because the, be, well, because, you know, it's on topic. It's about the human, you know, it's yeah. about the human condition, which is exactly what fiction is about. But I, but yeah. Yeah. Have you been, have you been reading or watching anything that you are um, particularly uh, compelled by? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> it 
it's funny because it's all to, it's all again about the same thing I've been watch I've watched just recently scenes from a marriage but <laughs> Oh my god. Le god. Let's... Oh my god, you really yeah, I know, you know, but you know when you're st Oh my god. Okay. When okay. you're when you're I think when you're also when you're starting a new relationship, right? I, I I don't see how you cannot think about all of these things all the time. Yeah. Because you're trying to sort it out in your own life. It's yeah. important to do that. Yeah. Well, anyway, let me ask you another question before this gets too emotional. Just, <laughs> just uh, some minutes ago when we were talking about uh, about depression and things like that, I was just about it was just about to crack me up. So that's <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Uh, uh, so I mean, when you're writing your stories. Uh, what would you say are some of the biggest influences there? I mean, do you draw mostly from your personal experience? Is it from other writers, the things you learn from other people, or probably it's a mix of it, right? It's, it, it is. It's a huge mix of it. And it's a multimedia sort of mix because um, I'm – you know, I, I, I'm not just influenced by other writers, I'm influenced by filmmakers. You know, I, I, I love the sort of visual, um, the visual aspect of filmmaking. I love being immersed in a world uh, that is not of my creation. And then I also love reading because then I can largely create that world, right? Even though obviously the writer tells us about the world, but you know, we really do fill it in more than we realize when we're, when we're reading. Um, yes, to my own experience. Yes, to experiences I've just sort of observed and read about. I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to think if there's one overwhelming um, theme here where, where I gravitate towards, towards, towards one influence. And I think that maybe when I was writing my Cold War historical thrillers, which I've actually just started writing a new one, um, while I'm doing edits for the fantasy series. But um, the Cold War historical thrillers, obviously I'm drawing on my own personal family experience more than anything else. And on the fact that I, um, you know, I, I, I lived in the former Eastern Bloc for several years and right, right after communism fell. And so that, I think, that particular genre, and when I'm writing in that genre, I'm drawing on that part of me more than anything else. Everything else is is sort of subject to that, you know, and and it's you know, it becomes I think a very um it very quickly becomes a very specific world, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um because everyone has the same motivations. because they're all being affected by the same um, system, basically, and they're reacting within those boundaries. And those are boundaries that I know really well because I grew up with people who grew up in those systems. And then I lived in a place where people grew up with those systems. And so I feel very intimately, um, I'm still an observer because I didn't grow up in those systems, right? But I feel very intimate with that. And I draw incredibly heavily on the stories that I heard growing up at my dinner table, whereas, you know, when I um, when I started writing this, the you know historical fantasy romantic epic that that I've been writing for the last few years, that was really starting from scratch to build a world. And interestingly, I, I mean, I think that even though I knew the world that I was writing about um, with my Cold War books better. Um, I think, hands down, my best writing has come in these books. Mm -hmm. I think, well, I mean, one part is because I've been practicing, <laughs> right? I mean, after you've written a couple of books, you get better at it. But it's more than that. It's because I had to create the world from scratch and because I didn't take anything for granted. And I think that one of the things that we are, that it's easy to forget because, you know, you, you, you know, you can be told, write what you know, Right. And um, there's also 
I think in, in our in, in sort of the current culture, you know, people talk about cultural appropriation a lot. Are you the person who should be telling this story? And I feel very strongly that um, my best work has come from writing about things that aren't outside of my experience. Mm -hmm. Because it's forced me to look at things differently. And really, when I just think of my own life, the things I've learned about myself, the, the sort of the most surprising things I've learned about myself has been from others, observations of me. Mm -hmm. And even um, even something as simple as style, I mean, one of the reasons why I, I like having my daughter or my husband pick out some clothes for me is because I know they're going to pick something that I would never pick for myself, but then I put it on and I'm like, oh my God, that looks great. And similarly, um, when, when I, I think it's because when I'm, I'm, I'm writing something like these, uh, when I'm having to create a world that didn't exist before, one that I have no reference points for, no specific reference points for, I'm having to draw on all of these influences at once. And I'm really having to mine my, um, well, first of all, I'm having to do res a hell of a lot more research, but also I'm, I'm having to mine my experiences and, and look at them from different perspectives. Um, in a way that I really don't have to do when I'm writing my Cold War historical thrillers, right? Because the kind of research that I have to do with those is very specific. It's like, well, I've, you know, I haven't been in Budapest in a long time, but my characters are in Budapest, so I've got to figure out what Budapest looks like. I've got to remind myself, right? Yeah. But I'm really familiar with the characters in the world almost to a point where I take them for granted. And I think that on one hand, that's good because it's, it's good genre fiction and it, it, it's very comforting to a reader. You know, they know exactly what they're going to expect. But it doesn't, um, it improves me tactically, but I'm not sure it does much to improve me as a writer and as a person. Mm -hmm. um, and having to write about what I don't know and invent that from scratch does. And I feel it happening. Right. Yeah, so let me ask you another thing. Does it ever happen to you that uh, you want, you would like to express something in writing that you don't think you can really put into words and that perhaps you think that it would work well or best in another artistic medium like for example if you were instead a comic book writer that perhaps it would work or if you were another kind of artist like a painter it would work but when we're talking about fiction and prose specifically uh, the, i mean do you feel do you are there any time is there any time where you find some limitations to this kind of artistic expression all the time all the time especially i think if you are interested in kind of multiple forms you know um I mean, I was just having this uh, this talk with my editor yesterday. Um, she was talking about how um, there was, I, I asked her if she could identify one scene that she particularly loved and one scene that particularly fell flat in the book. I just kind of wanted a, 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 a flash of um, insight in, 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 in that regard. I wanted to see what really stood out. And, and she told me, and the part that, did not stand out was actually a very densely action-packed sequence that would be much better expressed on film, for instance. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, I I was trying to figure out how to how to put it there and how to make it really compelling. And what's what's very challenging about writing, say, a very thrilling action sequence in a novel that is not an action novel. You know what I mean? That that's not the nature of the novel is that, you know, throughout other parts of the book, you're, you're dealing with the characters 
emotions, with their character, their circumstances, with how they're relating to others. And when you suddenly go into a sequence where they're having to react, you know, and where they're in danger, um, you lose that. Mm -hmm. And you have to figure out how to build it in. And that's really difficult because, I mean, just imagine yourself watching a, an action sequence in a film. And I, I suppose the way that they're able to express what's happening in the characters' minds is by facial expression, right? But you don't, I guess you can talk about facial expressions in, in, a, in, in prose, but it doesn't quite communicate it. And yet things are happening so quickly. It's very, very difficult to balance. That's a really, really hard part for me, at least. Maybe some people are great at it, but it's very hard for me to um, create a scene that has a lot of physical action in it and maintain an emotional connection to the characters, which is necessary because it's not an action book, right? You have to maintain that no matter what, because that's, that's the nature of what you're writing. So that's, that's a more immediate example of something that I was just dealing with um, quite recently. Um, and I mean, sometimes, yeah, I can think of times also when you're writing something and you realize, well, this is, this is kind of much more appropriate for a philosophical essay. Yeah. And it doesn't belong here, or I don't quite know how to, um, how to communicate this through the character, but the character shouldn't be saying it. Well, I mean, there are times where writers simply cheat a little bit and put those things there. Like, for example, yeah. Dostoevsky does it in The Brothers Karamazov. of yes. when, yeah. when, he, when he puts Ivan, uh, I mean, talking about the, um, the Inquisitor. I mean, that mm -hmm. bit where Ivan exposes that story about Jesus coming back to life and then being condemned by the Catholic Church. Right. And stuff like that. I mean, basically, it's a philosophical exposition in the middle of the f fictional yeah. narrative. Yeah, and it better well be brilliant, which yeah. in Dostoevsky's case it is, you know? Yeah. Because when I think when you, um, I think that's really difficult to do. You know, it's very difficult to add uh, philosophy or, or blatant philosophy, blatant ideology, or even a blatant action sequence. Yeah. Uh, and, and another writer who does that really well is Tolstoy, particularly in oh, w w War and Peace. So. I, I feel like there's something about Russians. That yeah, the, yeah I, that was, I, we've talked about this, but I think they're also kind of uniquely able to do that. Um, yeah. And that it, it, there's something about Russian culture, Russian style, Russian history that um, maybe makes it easier or seem, makes it seem more seamless for very gifted Russian writers to get away with that because it's usually cringeworthy when other people do it or just not very good or just boring, Yeah, you know? I mean, it's, you were talking about action and one of the things that came to my mind is uh, I'm reading or following because it's coming out on a weekly basis, a chapter per week, uh, a manga, a Japanese comic. Oh, called, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, call, uh, called Kingdom. And I mean, you were talking about action, and one of the things that immediately popped into my mind was that uh, in that sort of medium where you have always like small balloons of dialogue or a little bit of text here and there, uh, but you always have uh, images, I mean, drawings, right? Yeah. I, I mean, it's very easy to keep that balance because, for example, you're depicting a war there and there's lots of war in that mm -hmm. manga. Uh, and I mean, at the same time, if you're uh, intellectually interested in that kind of thing, it's very compelling because you have all the tactics and strategies exposed. And so that's very interesting. And sometimes those tactics also play a role in the narrative. You know, like, for example, some of the things that the tactic itself, it's not just to show off intellectual prowess or something like that, or to make a move or to be two steps ahead 
of the, the, the general from the other side or something like that. Sometimes it's a tactic that depicts the personality of the character who does it, you know. Uh, and, and you have that, but then on the other hand, since uh, there are always, uh, all the time you have, you're zooming in to focus on specific characters, the main ones or secondary ones or whatever, and you get uh, close-ups to their reactions, their expressions, and then you have bits of dialogue. I mean, it's very easy in that kind of medium to strike a balance between having lots of action, but at the same time being deeply emotionally connected to the characters. Because you're zooming in and out of the time and it's like having the big plan and the small plan I mean, at the same time, so, uh, but, but I mean, as I said, visually, it's much easier to do that. I think you're right. I wish I, I wish I was a better uh, artist because I think that I would find it very satisfying to be able to combine um, prose, you know, characters I've, I've made a mental picture of, you know, and, and, and characters, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're internal workings. And to be also, you know, able to draw their environment, I think that would be incredibly satisfying. And I'm really um, envious of comic book writers, you know, of manga, of people who can write these tremendously complicated stories and flesh out these really deep, and interesting characters, but also um, have the ability to create them, you know, create their physical space, create their, their physicality, you know, their, their yeah. facial expressions. Um, and, and you can, you know, match their facial expressions to what's going on inside of them. All of that is, it, it seems like that would be so incredibly uh, fulfilling to me. And, and, you know, the first time I ever read a comic book, like a serious comic book, you know, not yeah. something that I, I was reading as a kid, like Mad Magazine, you know what I mean? Was Mouse. Do you know Mouse? Uh, I don't think so, no. It's, oh, good. I can't remember the name of the author. I read it, you know, 25 years ago, but it's about the Holocaust. Hmm. And, um, you know, there are mice. I mean, they're mice, the people in it, right? Uh, and it's absolutely mind-blowing. It's so good. And I just, I, I, you know, I, I just couldn't believe that someone had created something so moving and smart and deep in a comic book format. Yeah. It's um it's an art and I'm blown away by it when it's because when it's done well it is like it, it's as good as as any story that you can find in a novel or or Oh yeah. Or Def film definitely. and it is it's rich and some of these can go on for years. That's what's incredible is that there's stories that can stretch on and on. I mean, the Walking Dead series just keeps on going. You know, I don't think it's ended yet. And it's it's probably going to go on long after the, you know, the television show is gone. And, you know, the television show has already uh, started to uh, wane. It has for a few years. But somehow to be able to sustain that world without tiring of it and without tiring out your audience yeah. is incredible. No, no, it's it's definitely amazing, and that's why I really love reading, particularly Japanese comics. I, I mean, it's it's not that the American are bad; it's just that I mean, there's something more to <laughs> to the Japanese. The Japan, I mean, uh, probably because they also have a different culture and they deal with some aspects of human life in different ways, and so it's yeah. it's refreshing in a way. 
Um, but I mean, what I find really, really genius is that, I mean, I think that one of the things that makes you an excellent comic book writer, I mean, someone really out of the ordinary is that you write and draw things in a way that what you what you draw isn't as good alone as it would be with the text or the yeah. or the dialogue and vice versa as well right. so i mean you add that bit of dialogue and the image gets a completely different meaning and another layer of emotion to it and then if, if you had just the dialogue without the image it wouldn't be as impactful <laughs> i i think you're right and i think it's it's it, it looks deceptively easy and yet you just nailed it because the yeah. image has to be perfect and the dialogue has to be perfect and then they have to match each other perfectly yeah and I, and, and i mean and i mean sometimes alone they are really great but together exactly. together, but together it's, it's just it's like an explosion it's a masterpiece yeah I, it, I i completely agree you know i You know, you can even see that in a medium like Twitter because um, when someone is able to combine, you know, a, a, a great comment with a great image, yeah. right, or or with a great meme, it, it just goes viral, right? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes it's stupid and it goes viral because it's stupid. Sometimes it goes viral because it's just inflammatory. It's yeah. not, it doesn't always go viral because there's something brilliant about it, but um but sometimes it, 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 you know, it captures people attention, uh, people's attention exactly um, in the way that you describe, because the image is a novel and the comment to the image is a novel <laughs> and you put them together and, and you've got a world. And somehow that, that uh, you know, and it was probably put together haphazardly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, as I said, uh, there are comics which I'm just completely in love with. That when I mentioned Kingdom, I, I mean, I, I love all aspects of it because the the guy who writes it is just a complete genius. I mean, the if if of course you have to be interested in that kind interested in sure. that kind of stuff. For example, it involves politics. It involves right relationships it involves war uh, military tactics and then i mean all the drama that goes on in a war and all the all what's the there not to love yeah yeah i, I mean, mean but, really yeah i mean but i mean there could be people that would be bored by just sometimes yeah. being expositions of the military tactics or strategies that they develop and i mean i find that really amusing so i I also love that part, but then I mean all of it combined, and all the dramatic tension he is able to create during a war. Uh, I mean the the parts where the main characters seem to be on the losing side, and then something almost miraculous happen, and I mean. Uh, sins of sacrifice, which sometimes, I mean, are just, <laughs> sometimes they just crack me up. I mean, I, I can't, I can't, I can't really be, I can't really hold my tears sometimes. Uh, and I, I, I mean, it's, it's all, all very well written and very well drawn and things complement each other extremely well and, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, lo I love literature and I love paintings, for example, as well. But yeah, me too. Uh, but when when you're able to combine to sort of combine both, and I mean, and sort of make uh, 
aesthetic movie because you have all the elements you have in the movie but with mm -hmm. it being static you know mm -hmm. what i mean uh, i i mean for, i i have I, ca i can't even express how much respect i have for people who are able to create something like that i mean it's it's ridiculous i agree it's like a well it's like a david lean movie you know in a sense because david lean i mean obviously it's you know, it's not cartoonish, but um, boy, talk about being able to combine sort of visual magnificence mm -hmm. um, with a powerful story and often very powerful dialogue that is not necessarily prolific. I mean, it's it, it, the dialogue can be really sparse and then music. Yeah. It's... Um, I wonder, you know, with all of this, uh, well, it's also, I mean, with all of these, these video games, but also I know that there are all of these sort of eBooks that are in, in development that also have um, the visual and that will incorporate music or sound mm -hmm. in, some, in some way. And it'll be really interesting to watch that art form develop and I, have you ever have you ever um, gotten an ebook of a car, of of a manga or anything like that? Of a it, it, like, how do they do that? Uh, you know, I've never I've never ordered, for instance, um, you know, I've never ordered something that has a visual element as an ebook. Have you ever tried that? I don't know exactly how it. Oh yeah. You know, like 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 if you ordered a manga as an ebook. Yeah, is that I, I mean, is it is it well done yet, or does it need a lot of work? Is it just not not there yet? No, no, I think it can be. It it yeah. it, it depends on the um, on the sort of software you're using. There okay. are there are uh, there's good software that you can use even on your computer, but then if you get an e-reader, which also uh, which is also able to process those kinds of formats formats that go associated with comics. I mean, right. uh, you usually, I mean, and, and particularly more so if the e-reader is wide enough, you know, mm -hmm. just for you to get the old page there and right. with sufficiently good dimension and zoom and all of those kinds of things. I mean, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a nice experience as well. Yeah. I'm just interested to see how that develops. I wonder how, I wonder if um, those visual elements will start to make the, their way more into um, just novels in general. And I, I, I wonder if there's going to be some way of combining the experience of film and literature in ways that maybe we haven't imagined yet specifically you know i mean we can imagine very broadly how something like that would come together but i really can't imagine specifically how it would come together well uh, I, I mean i mean one of the things that's interesting is that many people who, who read books and then get the book adaptations to movies i mean many people complain about it because oh they miss that part they miss that part right. they they mischaracterize that particular character they turn them into someone who is completely different from the book character i mean the, those kinds of complaints it's interesting because in japan it's very common that you have the following someone is writing a manga and yeah. then at the same time the anime starts coming out so i mean they are so, they so it's unfolding in real time basically like it's it's very yeah cool. let's say that someone starts publishing a new manga mm -hmm. and then i mean and then they give it like three or four years and when you have sufficient material they turn right. it into an anime that it's right. basically the animated version of the manga Right. Because you have already the visual element in, mm -hmm. the, in the manga, usually the anime, if not 100%, is like 98 or 
uh, a, a, a 99% uh, similar yeah. to the manga. I mean, th there's no uh, tweaking things like, for example, changing scenes, major scenes or something like that, or changing characters in a way that really turns them into different people or something like that. So, I, I, I mean, it's the anime are very faithful to the manga. And so, I mean, that kind of complaint you get with book to movie adaptations, it's very hard to get yeah. when it's manga to anime adaptations. I mean, some, sometimes you get that. Yeah, it's true. Right. Partic particularly when people are not sure if the anime will be able to run uh, for a sufficiently long period of time to cover the entire manga. Right. So, yeah, but when that happens, sometimes they mess it up a little bit and they cut corners and all of that. And yeah, it's, it's a bit messy. But I mean, when at, particularly when it's successful enough, usually it's really nice so. it sounds like it it sounds like it would be a very satisfying experience for the fans of the manga you know and that mm -hmm. there wouldn't be like you said that that sort of the haters <laughs> that, that that feel robbed of of you know a beloved experience yeah i mean what do you get most of the time in terms of complaints uh, okay, th there are people that simply prefer the manga for whatever reason. It's not that the anime is different, it's just that they prefer reading instead of watching or something right. like that. Right. But, but, then, but then when there are people that do both, many times what, what you get is not that the story is not the same, but the pacing is different because when you're reading, you have complete control of the pacing, particularly when the story is already finished. But yeah. when you're watching, I mean, you don't. <laughs> either, either you like the pacing or you don't. Sometimes, sometimes it seems rather slow. Sometimes it seems too quick, but right. Yeah. That's the kinds of complaints that you usually get from people who, who like that kind of stuff. Well, yeah. I mean, how, how much of I, I, how much of it is pacing too that we love about uh, any, any given story yeah. that that you know that we come to to feel attached to, you know, because we can linger on a certain scene. Yeah, or like you said, or sort of pass through ones that are that maybe don't um, quite capture our attention as much. Um, I feel like what you know when, when the last time when we were talking about um, how disappointed we were at the at the end of Game of Thrones or basically anything from like season five on. I think it was such a combination of um, losing the story, losing some of the characters, and mm -hmm. not getting the pacing right. Yeah. Yeah. it was all three of those things and with each successive season then until the end it 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 started it fell apart yeah yeah i i mean it, it i think it would be silly to say that anything out there being it a book a comic book a movie or whatever it would be silly to say that there's any book out there or anything like that that doesn't have any boring scenes at all <laughs> or any no, dull no. scenes. I, I mean, that, that's, I think that's simply impossible to not have that. I, I mean, the, sometimes you can, you can twist it a little bit and turn it into something interestingly boring. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, as, you know, I, Writers agonize over that, yeah. Because you know, in 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 a big long book that you're that you're putting together, um, it's it's a matter of constantly looking for ways to make exposition seem interesting and seamless, mm -hmm. character development, yeah, 
um, atmospherics, all of those things have the potential to be enormously boring, <laughs> you know, because you're, you're not necessarily moving the plot along with them. Sometimes you are, but you're, you're, they're mostly there to sort of buttress the story. And, and if you linger too much on them, it can be beautiful if you're, a, if you're really good at this, but if you linger too much on them, you give, if you give a reader or an audience too much of that, they start to doze off, even even if it's terrific. Yeah. And if you don't give them enough, then they feel cheated. And it's it's a constant um, battle with yourself, trying to figure out when you're boring and self indulgent. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess that's why I think I'm a much better, better conversationalist than a writer, because I I mean, I, it's easier to be interesting when you're getting immediate feedback from people <laughs> you know what i well, mean well you know i mean you can tell by the look on their face you can yeah. tell by their level of engagement yeah you know you it is you're right you're getting immediate feedback and the the feedback when you're writing or painting yeah is not at all immediate i mean it takes forever no, no. even with music something like music the feedback is more immediate yeah. Depending on, you know. The yeah, and, the, and, the even, playing, right? and even there, I mean, you have basically to go to the studio and even before that, write down the lyrics and write the music right. and, and compose the music and then go to the studio and try different things out until you get what you think it's best. Right. And, and that's all before you expose the music to an audience and then it can have a completely different effect than you were expecting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, like the, the story of, um, you know, Sting, the police's big hit, Every Breath You Take. I, I remember years ago reading um, an interview with Sting where, where he was saying, I can't believe people use this song at their weddings and that they view it as a love song. He's like, I thought it was a horrible little mean song about, yeah. you know, a, a, becoming unhinged, you know, when you're having a breakup and being kind of stalkerish. And, and it was interpreted completely differently by yeah. listeners, you know, and, and that is kind of funny. I mean, you know, with, with comedy, I think has, is, is most controversial in this aspect right now in the current sort of cultural milieu, um, because it, it's, it seems to be a place where people are taking, still taking some real chances yeah. uh, and saying things that, um, may be misinterpreted or not misinterpreted, just sort of interpreted broadly and in different, different, many different ways, you know, depending on your point of view. And, um, and it's, it's, it's interesting to watch um, who takes offense at what, yeah. and and uh, you know how you can listen to you know a comedy skit or whatever that is so that, that doesn't seem at all controversial and yet it is problematized you know and then and then you can read entire treatises about what a problem it was, um, written by you know. A anywhere from someone online to, you know, a, a, a journalist at a major publication. And I, I, it's kind of struck me how little we hear that kind of controversy around literature right now. Yeah. I, I think because it's just not being published. I think truly controversial sort of deeply self-reflective literature maybe is not, is not, getting through or is not being recognized or, you know, hasn't, people aren't finding it maybe in the sort of vast sea of what's out there. Um, or maybe people are simply afraid to write it, afraid of, you know, they're watching their P's and Q's too much. Yeah. You know, right down to something like, can I have a character? You know, we're talking about writing what you don't know or writing what you do know. Can I have a character who is of a different race than I am or ethnicity or a different gender? You know, those are those are, I think, big questions that people who are writing are considering. And um, and I don't know. Have you read Have you read anything recently that you find really um, uh, 
I, earth, I was going to say earth shattering, but maybe that's too dramatic, you know, but something that really made you think. A work of fiction where, where you thought, whoa, you know, and were maybe shocked by something that, um, or surprised by something that the author said, deeply surprised. And, and I mean, really felt it as something more than just an entertaining story, but maybe that the, uh, there was a social commentary in the work that um, is something you wouldn't expect. Let's put it that way. Have you, have you read anything of that ilk recently? I can't remember reading anything like that recently. No, I can't either, yeah. I mean, I mean so, something really unexpected. No, I don't think so. Me, me too. Um, and I, uh, I think probably the closest that I, the closest that I've come to something like that is a, a television show. I mean, it was it was White Lotus. Did you see White Lotus? No. Um, I highly recommend it. I think it's on HBO. Um, but what I what I liked about it is that there was a real attempt. By, um, by the authors of it, uh, by the writers, to surprise you and not do what is expected. I mean, for instance, there's this part where there's, uh, it, it's basically the premise is um, that all of these people are coming to a resort in Hawaii, a very exclusive resort called the White Lotus. Yeah. And it's sort of like, um, like if you take the love boat and fantasy island but make it a, a like an interesting sort of uh more literary story yeah and so you're following several different families right or several different people including the people who work there and so there are very interesting class dynamics because it, it which which that in and of itself was was surprising because right now there is there's just there is such um, a focus on, on gender and race in our cultural conversation that class, which is deeply interesting to me, you know, gets, gets sort of swept aside. And the class dynamics between the people who work there and the people who, who visit, who the story is ostensibly about, are, are really interesting. They're really smart, at times cringy, at times really funny. But I mean, you know, just to give you an example, there's this one part where there is a woman there who's, who is, um, she's a newlywed and she is very beautiful. She's a freelance journalist and she has married a very rich guy. And she's having a sort of identity crisis. You know, she wants to stay working and she wants to stay relevant and she's afraid of becoming this sort of socialite, you know, and of losing her identity. And there's this other woman who happens to be vacationing there who is a CEO of a tech company. And she is someone that this writer deeply admires. And in fact, she wrote um, a piece about this woman in a, for, for a magazine. And she ends up um, having coffee with her, you know, getting her to have coffee with her. And they're talking and, and, um, the CEO woman, you're, you're thinking that she might start mentoring the, uh, the newlywed. And then the newlywed says, oh, I just admire you so much. I even wrote a piece about you in X magazine. And then the CEO woman goes, that hatchet job? You, you know, and, and the, the scene completely changes. And later on, the, um, the, the CEO is telling her husband, oh God, that woman, it's, she said, oh, she's a sweet, sweet girl, but I mean, she's a terrible journalist. And she, you know, she wrote this stupid hatchet job on me that was supposed to be a puff piece and everything. And, and you realize as you're watching it that she's right. You know, you're, you're, you're thinking that you're supposed to be rooting for this young woman who married this rich guy and that, oh, you go girl, she's gonna come into her own. But as you're watching, you realize, well, she's, she's not really very talented. <laughs> You know what I mean? And it's just things like that that are so surprising because it's and it's not blatant; it's it's subtly done, but um, but that you don't that you don't see a whole lot of right now because yeah. it's mean, you know, and and uh, it, it is mean. Yeah. You know that it was mean to both women, 
in a way. But it was also um, interesting and real and human and funny, deeply funny. Yeah. I, I guess I have to watch that. I really like the, the way you're describing things there, and that's really the it's, sort of show I tend to like. So, uh, I think you'd really like it. It was very, very fun. I mean, our, our whole family, you know, rarely do we align on a show and binge watch it together. And um, that was one of the ones that we really aligned on and binge watched. I think the last time that happened was with Homeland. <laughs> Maybe curb your enthusiasm. <laughs> oh, like... oh my God! Oh yeah, it curb your enthusiasm. There's another season coming out now, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is. Oh, I yeah. have to watch that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's terrific. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I mean, perhaps just to, I mean, we can keep talking, but just to embarrass myself a little bit before I finish the recording here. <laughs> going back, going back to that bit where I said that I I was a bad writer except when I was in love. So <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm that in and of itself is a novel, right there. Just what you just said. That's what a great first line for the novel too. I was a bad writer except when I was in love. <laughs> just go <laughs> from there. You know, I mean, really. <laughs> No, really, no, no, but what's, in, what's interesting is that I don't even think I have the mind of a proper writer. Uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of cheating because what happens is that things just pop into my mind, like, like verses or phrases or sentences. And then, I mean, I start writing and it just it just comes out. I mean, yeah. oh, oh, the only things I write well are the ones that are effortless for me. <laughs> so, it just comes out. And I mean, so I, I, don't, I don't even care, at least most of the time, to like write down whatever comes to my mind and then review it or whatever before sending it to the special person right but <laughs> but uh, i mean i mean i usually just write it down and send it immediately and i mean i usually get good feedback so <laughs> it's like charles bukowski who used to write it on bar napkins <laughs> on bar napkins <laughs> which is just great um no, but I think you're, I think you're right. And, you know, that's, I, I really admire people who can, who can do that actually, who can write sort of from the gut that way. Sometimes I can do that. Sometimes yeah. it comes out easily and um, it, 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 it flows in a way that feels, oh, it's, it's rapturous, you know, it, it, it it's like, if you combine some some level of joy with a bloodletting, I don't, you know, of of maybe a beautiful view with a bloodletting. I don't even know how else to describe it. But um, but most of the time, especially uh, sitting down long form, you got to work and work and work at it, and you've got to toy with it. And uh, you know, I so many writers like you just hate the editing process. Hate it. It's it fills them with tremendous dread. And it's not even because they're so attached to their words that they can't bear to change them. But it's, it, it just, it, it, it's, it's that they're filled with dread at having to edit. And I get it. I actually, for the most part, really love the editing process. I've grown to love it. I don't think I did when I started out, but now I love it. Um, because it's, it's that opportunity to reinvent yeah. through your own prism. Mm -hmm. You know, to reinvent something that you've already written that maybe you didn't write well enough, that you didn't flesh out well enough, and then the, you know, to 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 have the opportunity to revisit that can actually be really uh, satisfying, but um, it's painful too. Yeah. Well, I mean, I also don't care much about 
uh, rewriting or reviewing because I, I mean I don't do it professionally I only do it for one person at a time <laughs> so yeah. uh, and I and I mean I, I guess that I guess that yeah it, it's always it's also a biased process because if you're already in, I mean in the early stages or before the relationship starts it's different but when you're already in the relationship i mean basically the other person tolerates a lot of, <laughs> of things from you so uh, i i mean I, as as i said i i don't think i ever got bad feedback but yeah there's that bias and then i mean even when when someone tells me, oh, but <laughs> this, is a, this is a bit lame. And I say, okay, but did you like it? Is it beautiful? Yeah, okay, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's just something in the moment. I write it down and it's written and I don't care about because when I'm do because I only do it when it feels right and if it feels right I'm not worried about it so I think yeah I think that that is a certain um what I love about that is that it's that it combines writing with performance art mm. in a sense because that is a certain level of not performance art because that's not, that sounds wrong. I, I mean more the immediacy of performance art where you're doing something and you're not going to do it again. Yeah. You know, that, it, it's going to be different every single time and there's no way to tinker with it and recreate it because it's already out there. Right. So I'm, I'm speaking of performance artists very, very broadly, not just something that is con contrived for, you know, an art, art show, but it could be stand up comedy, for instance. Or, yeah, or improv, like or the, the improv, you know, and I think improv, that, yeah. yeah, and um, I, I think th there's something just very creative and exciting about that too. It really is kind of like a volcanic eruption, isn't it? Right. Yeah. And, and it, it makes sense that it would, that it would come most easily when you're going through something like, you know, like falling in love, which is like a volcanic eruption because it's that intense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are a few things that offer you such an immediate sense uh, and intensity of emotion as as love, maybe running for your life, you know, being chased by a killer offers you that immediacy, but um, but not in a not in that sort of pleasurable, painful, rapturous kind of way that love can. Yeah. That's why I write about love so much. Why why love is such a big part of everything I write? How can you not? I just don't see how. You can't reflect on it because it's such a huge part of our lives. Even when it's not happening, it's, it, it's outsized. It hovers unspoken, right? Because we're wishing it was happening. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, the, 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 this is how it works for me. It, it either, it's either uh m spontaneous momentaneous and effortless or it doesn't work at all i mean if i have to think for two seconds about w before i while i'm writing uh it, it doesn't work <laughs> it doesn't work what's the longest piece you've ever written like when you've sat down and you've just felt like you know, you want to, something in you needs to get out. Oh my God, a wasp just landed on my. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think it's dying. Um, <laughs> what's, what's the longest piece you've ever written? Just, you know, letting it flow out of you like that. Don't know. At least 10 pages or something like That's that. That's a lot. That's at, a lot. At least that, probably 15, perhaps. Yeah, that, I, I I mean, that's, that's 
that's huge for that kind of um, I mean, emotional outlet, you know, that kind of most, yeah, most of those writing impulses come in the, in short forms, like yeah. for example, aphorisms, yeah, short poems, short yeah. prose, yeah. I mean, stuff like that, like uh, at most one page long or something like that. Yeah, I mean, how could it not? Imagine if you sat down and wrote 50 pages that way. I, how how many? It's like you'd be up for days, you know. Yeah, I mean, just exhausted beyond belief. Yeah, po possibly, possibly, in the span of two months, I can write fifty pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably, yeah, because uh, yeah, I've already accumulated. Lots of that kind of material, and yeah, I I am. You can piece it together the way uh, the way uh, the Portuguese novelist Fernando um, Pessoa. Pessoa. I keep wanting to say Paseo. Pessoa, the way his friends piece together the Book of Disquiet, and and probably a lot of his work after he died. Well, right? I mean, if anyone wants to look into my art drive after I'm dead. Why not? It. Piece Make it together, it. patch it up, put yeah. it out there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, the only thing I know is that for one of my relationships, I have at, at least one Word document who is like 80 pages long or something like that. So That's a lot. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's an incredible... No, but that's also incredible chapter of your life to look back on. Do you like to read it? Do you like to go back and read it or no? Like, no, I'm done. I wrote that. I don't need to do it. No, no. no I mean, I mean, if, for example, I'm, I'm in the relationship, I don't care at all. I mean, I even like it if the, the girl, the girl wants to go back in her messages and read again what I wrote. But, but I, I myself, I don't do it. No, right. uh, I mean, it's just like uh, writing someone down on a paper and then setting it on fire. So like, like, like if it had a timer, so right. you, you read it and then two seconds later, it just burns. It evaporates. Yeah, yeah. It detonates. Yeah. Yeah. It's something like yeah, that. I, I, I think you're right. I think it's, it's something hard. like that. I mean, now with technology and so on, of course, those things are still out there somewhere. But yeah, but uh, I mean, when I write, it's basically with that intent in mind. So. Yeah. Well, I think also because it's such a personal, you know, it's it's easier, I think, and to want to go back and read something you've written about a character you've created rather than something that has come from you, you know, directly and yeah. during a time of heightened emotion. Yeah. I, I don't know that I'd want to revisit that either. Not even because it would be, I mean, maybe it would be painful, but also it's just, it's exhausting and I've done it. I don't need it anymore. I've exercised it. Yeah, and I mean, and I mean, th there's another thing. I also don't like to recycle what I did. So, right. I mean, I mean, if I'm with a new person, th th that's the only kind of effort I take when writing. Yeah. I also, uh, I always write new material. I never yeah. go, even if I have. Uh, saved some documents from other times. I mean, I I never go back to them and I mean pick something right. I wrote back then that that might even yeah plausibly apply the same here. But I mean, I don't like doing that because uh, I also I get the sense that if I wrote it for someone else, it would seem like. I don't know <laughs> it, it, that it wouldn't be genuine. So, 
Hi guys, thank you for watching the interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. I will leave links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. Any amount, even just $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peruga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windega, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbo, Jorge Espinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Robert, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreff, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, My Producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafini, Akion Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardes France and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.